All right, how's it going, everybody? This is Is Morta, and this is episode thirty, the big three zero of my custom campaign for Kingdom Death Monster, and this is Lantern Year Nine, and we're going to be showing you today the hunt phase going after the phoenix, this big creature that you see in front of you, which I will give you a better look at. Um, I do have to say, um, from my experience with Kingdom Death Monster miniatures, I've really appreciated, honestly, and this goes same thing with Armada, Star Wars Armada as well, is I've really appreciated the bigger miniatures. Not only because they, yeah, because they look cool, because of the scale, but because the bigger miniatures, you could show more detail, more fine-tuned little nooks and crannies on the creatures. So, so that so it's, it's it's interesting like the, the bigger ones yeah, it's, it's more intimidating it's a cool you know display piece or a table but you just you can see a lot of the better detail than having a small miniature because you have printing considerations that you can't you can only have material at, at a minimum thickness so it's really cool so so again um so for this stream it's going to be the the parting of the survivors and bonuses and things that affect them and then I'm going to do the hunt and then I'm going to do the arrival to the showdown and then setting up the showdown board and initial strategy so it's be the hunt and strategy involved in doing the hunt okay so here is the Phoenix miniature be careful picking up because it's very top heavy um, I'll get a couple shots that way we can zoom in. But yeah, it's, it's the largest miniature that I currently own for Kingdom Death Monster. It's not the biggest miniature I own. The biggest one I own is probably the Super Star Destroyer for Star Wars Armada. But uh, this is the largest miniature for this game that I own. And I plan on getting another uh, large miniature. And that's also the mouth, which is really a face in the mouth if you can see it. If you can't see it now, don't worry. Uh, I want to show you the art. It probably help display that better as well. But uh, it is so cool. It just like it just uh, it's a cool novelty and aesthetic to the game. You know, just having this cool toy or this cool like statues, statuesque. I like it. Now, gameplay wise, one thing that that's unfortunate about it is it doesn't quite fit the space. So you kind of have to overlap. So, usability-wise, there's a slight issue, but, you know, you can still make it work. You can just put it, like, over the cards and slide it, but, yeah, really cool piece. And, honestly, this is one thing that really got me excited about getting the game, because this is the first game at that time that I ever saw that had this gigantic, detailed, nightmarish creatures you could buy in a board game. I was like, whoa, crazy. Besides other stuff, like, I think one of the things that make this game so great slight sidebar it's because there's just many things to it it's like one of the reasons um that i like star wars rebellion so much is you have area control you have resource management you have combat you have um sending dudes out to do stuff this game has a lot of elements to it it has this whole like what i like about monster hunter the fact you're trying to chase a monster battle monster and then carve pieces from the monster but then also, if you look at the gear grids, has this whole puzzle mechanic, trying to collect resources to make stuff, and then trying to make combinations and the affinities to get bonuses. So like a puzzle collection mechanic and resource management, all gluing together to make one uh, fun uh, element of the game. But then also it's laced with story, but then the story is also random, and there's so many different paths you can take. And it's also a self-run campaign, so you can play it whenever you want. So it just it's got a lot of things going for it that I really like. And then just like this persistent world, I can just keep myself engrossed in and uh, play it whenever I have time. Um, and that's one reason why I want to share these videos. So if you don't have this game, which is hard to find and expensive, or the time to play it, that you can watch my videos and experience it with me. So I hope you enjoy. All right, so... 
before I get any more involved, I did want to show you the current strategy and miniatures that I'm going to be taking into this. And then I'll f fix this view. So, uno momento. So I want to show you current strat and current miniatures. So I've decided the four I want to take out. Like I had mentioned last time, I kind of want it to have be a mixed group. I don't want to take all my best people in case something bad happens. And also, you don't want to take all your best people because you want to give everyone a little bit of experience as you go. Um, that way you have seasoned people and people starting out. So you can give the weaker people, start getting them good stats, as well as... Uh, or people close to getting specializations. And then experienced people you want to have out just because you know they're dependable. Um, so what I have now is effectively eight people that could go on hunts and, th and my two batteries and Isma. So 11 people. So I mixed my group. So I have two people that went out last time and two people that did not. Um, so I'm taking Eve just because it's a new boss. I want to try to take advantage of killing it with critical hits and carving the monster. I want to take Adam just because the fact that he's cursed, that means every time he's ever in ast Aftermath, he's going to get free armor. And so for anyone that's going out with this gear grid, he's the only person that would ever have the regal stuff. So that's free armor. So I just want, he's the best suited for this gear grid and so I was like, let's take him out and get more stuff. Um, Timothy, I wanted to take out because I couldn't take Samantha because she had post-traumatic stress. And so that's a good replacement. He's pretty powerful. And then I wanted to take Oko um, because I didn't want to take Emily because she also had King Step. And I didn't want to have two people with King Step because Adam also has it to be in this. That's why, in case it's a complete wipe, I don't lose King Step. Because that would be important if I ever fight the King's Men again, to start out with it. And I wanted to take uh, Timothy, in particular, because he also had Red Fist. And I wanted to have the Red Fist bonus. And it's true, Timothy is also the person with marrow hunger. But I'm not taking him out here to die or anything. If anything, he's actually the best character currently on the entire settlement. So, and like I explained last time, my settlement is all about embracing life and death. And uh, so far, he's been the single person that's capitalized most from bearing children and killing people in the settlement. So, he's actually embodying the, the religion, if you think about it. All right, and so the mentions I'm using, Adam, I'm using this, this dude. Eve, I'm using this one, even though it's male, just because it's the closest thing that looks like a club. Um... Oko, I'm using a uh, the spear because it's a spear, even though it's a dude. And Timothy, since um, it's also a dude, a male, I decided to use this miniature that I haven't used yet, I believe, in this campaign. One of the other starting miniatures. Check it out. And again, here's the uh, the phoenix. All right, sorry, I want to say talk about strat record. So the, for the strat for these gears, it's pretty much the same. You have this person who's all about um, getting into positions by dashing and then using a ranged attack or heavy hitting in close. This individual who, um, who has decent armor and can dependably use survival, this person doesn't have great armor but has the ability, if in close, to ensure that the, the monster has minus one speed, which effectively, as a, a team, you can avoid damage because it's less attacks coming at you, and which is also why I g gave Frenzy Drink, and so I couldn't make this more powerful. And I left a gear open, only because if I happen to get a piece of regal gear that isn't a cloth or skull helm, this way I have space for it without having to sacrifice a piece of gear. Um, for Timothy, he's rocking the typical cat stuff profile, which will work well with him since he has plus four strength. That's going to make these hit very easy to wound. And he's almost plus two accuracy. He'd also have an amazing chance to hit. 
And then Oko is actually specialist with the spear, to, so it's an opportunity to gain more spear points. And uh, this is, has the same typical loadout. And again, I'm really going to try to take advantage of boss mini, the fact that with a king spear, you attack on the diagonal. Then that means people can be orthogonal to, to someone with a king spear and still get the benefit of boss mini. But for boss mini, they have to be adjacent, with, which means orthogonal to somebody. Okay, that's strat. All right, so it looks like I'm about to run out of power, so I'm gonna plug this in, adjust the zoom, and then we will start with uh, the departing survivors phase. Okay, so let me put this up for the time being, and then I'll zoom in later, that you guys can more easily see the phoenix in. His glory. Okay. So now I'm doing departing. So when I depart, um, as a easy guy, I have a running total here for the settlement. Anything that the settlement does, otherwise I check the gear grids to see if anything triggers when you depart. So I know when I depart, everyone gets plus three survival. And then I will then be checking also each person's gear grid to see if anything triggers when they also depart. All right, so we'll do Oko first. And I also need to update their gear grids because some of these people swap in and out. So I need to update the gear grids and then do the party. So I'll just do it all in one, one shot. Okay, so Oko. First, we'll update the armor. Um, he has, he should have um, five to head because it's it's the armor plus two, which that screen armor provides. Five to head, and then four to hand, and then four to body, and then five to waist. You know, protect those loins. And four to leg. His insanity is currently ten. His survival is three. He gets three, so he's at six, which is the current limit. And then we look at the weapon. His primary is what I put here. So speed is two, accuracy is six, but he also has plus three accuracy, which reduces it. So the accuracy is three. Fits on a three. Strengths of three, which is also not correct because you get plus two from Monster Tooth, so strength is actually a five. And now we can check any other departing stuff. Okay. So Oko is okay. Next up we got Timothy, who ha should have four to everything. I'm sure three to everything, that's plus one, and the white line gear is two. And he currently has seven insanity. And then his survival's already at six, so that's a change. And then anything else when they depart? No. Okay. Um, now let's double check the weapon, because that may have changed. So speed is not two, it's two plus two plus the set bonus, so it's five. Speed five, because the white line set. Lock is not one, it should be two because of deadly. Actually, it should not even be one. It should be zero, and then he adds one, so it's one. And then evasion, his default is one. Okay, and then accuracy is a seven, and then he adds two, so it's five, so that's still correct. And then strength, he adds four, and the line and the guitar is seven, but by default it's plus two. I'm sorry, it's three, by default plus two, so it's four, and then plus four, so it's strength is eight. Let me do that again, math again. Three plus two is five. No, that's not right. 
strength three plus two is five, plus four is nine. Strength is actually nine in Timothy. It's really high. Hits on a five, five times, nine. Yeah, I mean, he's honestly the best character. Okay, next up we got Eve. Again, the sexes and not everything matches. He's just the best mistress at this time. I am going to consider um, really starting next week to start making probably new miniatures, um, especially once I know what to do with the Phoenix, once I start getting gear, and also make the next two Nemesis encounters after the hand, which will be the next new one coming up, but not the next one, just so I have ready because I can take time to make. So I'll let you know that that will be happening as well. Um, Eve should have two to everything. Insanity, seven. Um, survival will go to six because of the bonus. Let's see, anything else went to part? Let's check. Extra survival, which I don't need. Um, and then the weapon hasn't changed. It should still be two and then six, and then five, six, seven, plus one is eight. One evasion because of the gear. Luck, three by default, so yeah, she's still kicking. And then Adam. So I have to remember, the one that looks more savage in their posture, that's the one who's more savage. And the one that's more calm will be a Timothy, there. So Adam um, is at two survival plus three goes to five. Remember the cap is six, so it can still gain one. Seven insanity, and stats should not have changed because it went out last time. Uh, speed is two plus one is three. Accuracy is six, seven. Plus one is six because it reduces it. Strength three. Evasion by default is two. Um, but missing the extra evasion, so it goes to two. Now I kept going back and forth whether to have the monster grease or frenzy drink because this would be extra defense, whereas this is extra defense on everybody if this hits. Um, so, I decided to go with uh, Frenzy Drink. We'll see how it goes. Plus, I give myself a bonus to Insanity if I needed it. So, I'm trying that strat. See how it goes. Okay, anything else on Depart? Not that I can see. Alright, so we've done all the Departing bonuses. That means now we're ready to do the hunt. So... I always have to say who's the uh, hunt revealer, and it always changes, so I'll have it go counterclockwise starting with Eve. Why am I doing that? Because I want Timothy to be the one that triggers this, because I don't know what the hell this is going to do. It may be super dangerous, and so I would rather have Timothy do it because he's got some extra courage. So just in case he gains the courage before then, he'll uh, maybe be able to do something. No one has three understand your courage, so I'm not going to get like any actual real bonus, but we'll see. Okay, so to set this up in order, we have Eve with the, is this dude? Eve here, and then we have Timothy, and then we have Oko, and then we have Adam. All right. Let's get a swig of coffee. Kick this baby off. This is exciting because it's a br brand new quarry for this campaign. I fought this, I don't know, a couple years ago, but I only fought it once and did it once. So there's a lot of stuff I haven't seen and I only vaguely remember some types of, of things that the monster did. So 
It's gonna be exciting. It's gonna be new for everybody. All right, so we're chasing the monster. So technically, it should be like this. Let's do it. So first, we go here. So we roll two d tens because we want to roll a d one hundred. So again, this is the tens. This is the ones. And a natural lantern on this is a zero because there's no zero on this. That way you get like single numbers, like a five for the roll. But if I get a double zero, that counts as a hundred because you can't have double zeros. So that's a 100. But if you have this and like a, a nine, that's a nine. Whereas I have a four and a lantern, that'd be a 40. Okay, here we go. Make sure the right person's going first. Okay. Okay, so we got a six and a natural lantern. So that's a 60. So now I'm going to the part in the uh, rule book slash art book, King of Death Monster, to find uh, what corresponds to that number. I keep forgetting where it is in the book. I keep forgetting if it's before the showdowns or after the showdowns. I mean, all the showdowns I think are in the back, so it should be before. There we go. It's, part, it's core rules is before story events. Okay. So 60, that is wildfire. A massive wall of flame obstructs the survivors, incinerating the ground. It has destroyed whatever awaited the survivors and left chaos in its wake. Archive all hunt event cards in the next two hunt spaces. Place two basic hunt event cards in those spaces. Now see that's, I mean that that honestly like I get in, in theme what it's talking about, but in actually that's bad writing, because are you saying to place two hunt cards in each space, or one card in in, in each of the spaces? It just says place two basic hunt event cards in those spaces. So does that mean place two one and one or place two and two? I'm assuming because you can only have one card per space, it's one and one. But, you know what I mean? Like, the writing could have been a little bit tighter just so you get rid of the ambiguity of it. Archive hunt event cards in those two spaces. And then play... It, it, I, I would say place one basic hunt event card in each space. That would have been more clear. Because right now I'm trying to assume. Place two basic hunt event cards in those spaces. Place two basic hunt. Hmm. Okay, so I know. So the next two spaces, like technically each of these spaces are supposed to have cards. Um, that's not um, the monster. The reason why I don't put it there is because all it says is rolled on the table, and I already know that. Um, so it's saying that I replace, like this was a phoenix, instead it'll be a basic hunt. And this is already a basic hunt, and now it's a basic hunt. The question is, do I place one in each of two? I'm trying to archive all hunt event cards in the next two hunt spaces. I'm doing it for this one, which I rolled. So these two. Place two basic hunt event cards in those spaces. Whereas what it should have said is place two basic hunt event cards in each space or one hunt event card in each space. Um, I'm assuming it's one and one. Because I'm assuming what's happening here is It destroyed whatever evidence there was 
Uh, I'm, thematically, I think what happened is there was a fire, so it destroyed evidence of the, uh, of the phoenix being there. So I'll play that way, since I'm not entirely sure. So that was that reveal. Okay. I like to say I could be wrong, but it's uh, ambiguous, and I'm not going to stop what should be a shorter stream to go look it up. <laughs> okay, so, so that was that reveal. Now, this could be the revealer for this one. So I can roll the table again. Ah, oh, so we missed out on getting to see another Phoenix card. Damn. I just want to see if it's new, but honestly, there's a hundred different possibilities as far as the hunt table for basic. A lot, a majority I have not seen also, but I just want to see new content. Okay, so this was, remember, this is the tens. So this is 79. So fire concealed wherever this phoenix was, or maybe the phoenix did something and started a fire. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, so this is 79. Dying Small Prospector. If your settlement already has a porculus key, the prospector is gone. Roll again on the hunt event table before moving on the hunt board. We do not have that, so we continue. The survivors discover a body slumped against a large stone face. Moving closer, they find a small, dying prospector riddled with arrows. As they approach, he growls a warning, threatening them with a huge stone shard. When he sees that they are not evil monsters, he calms down and gives them a key. With his dying breath, he says, This is the key to the porculus. Without it, you will never get through. Record the porculus key in the settlement record sheet notes. And then if the settlement had graves, other stuff would happen, but we don't, so I'm not going to spoil that for you. But we record that we have a porculus key. So, I assume that that's an object, not a resource. So I'm just gonna add that here in storage. I'll say port culus. How do you spell that? Port culus. Port culus key. So we found we found something good. All right. So we saw there was this huge fire, and then we find someone dying that has this weird artifact that we took. <laughs> and now we continue. So everybody continues on to here. And now will be Oko that leads the charge into this space. Dramatic spin. Okay, so that was a 32. Thirty-two is sudden madness. The event revealer is devastated by a piercing cacophony in their head. So that's Ogo, the person with the spear. Roll one D ten. got a seven. If the result is less than or equal to their current sanity, they go mad, lashing out at their compatriots. If it's less than or equal to their current insanity, 
It is not. So we, we avoid attacking our friends. But because we're more insane than what we drew, because um, his insanity is a 10, then the event revealer has the crazed fighting art. They gain insight from their ordeal. Gain plus 10 insanity and plus 2 understanding. So this person got a cool cool um, new understanding and fighting ability, but now is just as insane as Snahavian, remember, who went mad after the Screaming Antelope died and just ran into the darkness. Because now Oko has 20 insanity, which is stupid high. But because he was so insane, it did protect him from attacking his friends. But now what's going to happen? So he's got 20 insanity, and then also he gained plus 2 understanding. So he goes from 0 to 2 to understanding. And then also learns crazed. Which is unfortunate because he already has 3 fighting arts, so it does have to replace 1. But I can also, but then I could also choose. So I want to keep extra sense, and I want to keep unconscious fighter. But on the other hand, he has so much insanity. If he has last man standing, I don't know what the Fink's going to do. He could be the person that's most likely to, to survive. Um, so I'll get rid of unconscious fighter, and I'll add crazed. But actually, you know what? Let's see what Craze does get, because I don't really remember what that does. And maybe Craze, on a perfect hit, gain more insanity. <laughs> Great, he can be super insane. Okay, so... Do I keep Last Man Standing, which is Last Survivor cannot bleed? If, if, if he's the Last Survivor, he cannot bleed or get knocked down. Otherwise, it takes with unconscious fire to seven blades kill. So I think I'm gonna go rid of unconscious fire. That way in case it goes to shit. He has the best armor, he has the best insanity, the best protection, he's most likely to live. Since I don't know how the fight's gonna go. So I'll do that. I'll go rid of unconscious fighter. Hope I don't regret that later. And add crazed. But it does sort of make sense. He's crazed, he's like I'm immortal, I can do anything. So, this sort of makes sense. Crazed, uh, on a perfect hit, gains one insanity. Let's write down what it does. Cool. All right, so Oko is now the most person with the most understanding, and Timothy is the person with the most courage in this uh, party. Okay, so that was it for that event. They all move in. Now the person leading the charge is going to be Adam, who's looking at the first Phoenix card. Which says... Reoccurring Nightmare. I'll just have you just take a look at the card. Don't worry about trying to read it because I'll read it to you. I just want to just show you what the card looked like. And the cool uh, art on the top. Okay. Without warning, the survivors are plucked from time and find themselves standing at the threshold of the overwhelming darkness, which is right here. Place the survivors on overwhelming darkness and trigger the story event, even if they have already encountered it this hunt phase. And then other stuff happens, but I'll reveal that later. Okay, so we do the overwhelming darkness story event. Right meow. So let me turn to that. See, you can get some story time too. I mean, the hunts to have story time, you know, random stuff that happens, but this is just cool because it involves choices. That's why I like it. 147. Well, I guess the hunt stuff does too. That's not true. A lot of different ways to get story. 
which I like. Okay, so this is Overwhelming Darkness. So I'll show you the pick first. And then choices and stuff is to be had. Overwhelming Darkness. All survivors must determine their paths and walk them simultaneously. So anyone that's insane walks the path of the insane. Anybody with three plus courage walk the path of the brave. And if they're not insane or courageous to get through the darkness, they are in path of the doomed. So it's like to get through the darkness, you have to be insane or courageous. Otherwise, you're just in a bad place. Um, but I believe everybody's actually insane. So we have 7, 20 seven and seven to be insane you have to be three plus so everybody is insane so now i roll for every survivor to determine what their habits them walking the path of the insane so i use four dice and i'll roll for everybody and then see what happens and I'll start with uh, Adam, and I'll go counterclockwise. So we got a three. We got a seven. Make sure you can see. Got a five. And I got a four. And I'll re do results same means. So. Adam, you feel safe and welcome within the darkness. Spend all your survival to shake yourself from this delusion or wander into the darkness lost forever, dead. So he either dies or he has to spend all this survival. So it's a good thing to have frenzy drink. So at least he has higher stats even though he's got no survival. Ouch. So the survivor right now is zero. Okay. Next up is Eve. He rolled a seven. A huge eye stares at you from the darkness. It scares you sane. Set your insanity to one and gain the post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's also bad. Now, so, wait, that's it. So he lost his survival, whereas she is losing all of her insanity except for one. So she's not currently insane and has just one brain protection. And that also gets post-traumatic stress, which is the same thing that happens to Samantha. The fact that she can't contribute or accumulate endeavors. Um, so the max I get is three coming back. And then also she has to skip the next hunt. So I'll go ahead and mark skip next hunt on her. And then post traumatic stress, which is no endeavor. contribute so we can't can't spend endeavors and can't add to endeavors and have to skip the next hunt i know what that does is because i've seen it so many times before okay let me make sure that was it set your insanity to one and gain post-traumatic stress okay next up we have a five which is uh timothy you shriek and lash out. All survivors suffer one event damage to a random hit location. Okay, so now I'm rolling damage on everybody. So Adam, Eve, 
Now the question is, does he do it to himself? Let me check that. All survivors. Okay. Okay. So we got one damage to chest, which is light damage. Adam may very well die. <laughs> it's very possible. Uh, Eve took one to hand, so death goes two to one. And the reason why I said that for Adam is because he has light damage to the body, meaning if he gets hit one more time, he takes heavy damage, he gets knocked down. Um, Timothy took one to chest, so that goes three to two. And that's why it's important also to have stuff that gives you survival and sanity when you depart, as well as when you arrive to showdown, because you could spend stuff during the hunt and see. Blue through survival, blue through insanity, taking damage to armor, and then one damage to head, so that goes from five to four on Oko. Okay, anything else? Nope. Now the last one is Oko, who rolled a four, which is the same thing. You shriek and lash out, all survivors suffer one event damage to a random hit location. So we do it again. Got one to head, fortunately got head protection. One to chest. One to foot. And one to chest. All right, so Adam took one to head. So it goes three to two. Eve took one to chest, so it goes from two to one. Timothy took one to foot, so it goes from three to two. And Oko took uh, one to chest, it goes from four to three. So what I've learned is, unless you roll high, or potentially courageous, uh, bad stuff happens. And I can imagine how worse it is if you're not at least insane. All right, so that was overwhelming darkness. And now that also means that everybody is now actually in front of the monster. Because monster is actually on this space here. So now other stuff happens as well. Because of the positioning. If the monster is between the survivors and the start space. Start space survivors in between. Or on Overwhelming Darkness, the survivors are ambushed and begin the showdown immediately after resolving the event. So what does that mean? Normally whenever you do a hunt, the, uh, the top, the round, the monster goes and then the survivors go. But because it's an ambush, that means the monster gets a free turn before we do the top, the round. So the monster will go twice before we go once. And notice we also have some people that have taken light damage. Everyone took light damage. And Adam lost all of his survival. Eve practically lost all of her insanity. So we're in a situation for sure. Uh, but that's it for the hunt. So now we set up the showdown. So before I set up the showdown board and then the strategy of how we're going to set up, um, everybody arrives at the showdown. So we do those stats. So when we arrive, because of the harp, everyone gets one survival. But then people also get more arrival stuff depending on what it says on their stuff. So I'll start with uh, Adam and go around. Does he have anything that says arrive? Other than the harp, no. So it gets one survival. So it goes from zero to one. Eve has 
is nothing else says when you arrive, so it just gains one survival, but it is already at six. Timothy says anything when you arrive. Let me check. Nope. So it just gets one survival, but it's already at six, so is good to go. And then Oko has on arrival at an acanthus plant. And on arrival gained three insanity. So his insanity is now twenty-three. Very high. I have people with some insanity. I have, I have two people who are insane. One person that's not insane, but has a little bit of insanity. And one that just batshit crazy. Um, and also gains an acanthus plant on the game board. Who also adds plus two to the result if he's the one that goes up, that does it. I had forgotten about that. So we also add a canthus plant. It's a canthus plant card, so we actually add two. So let me get that out. So, and I've already, well, I'll show you the showdown stuff before I talk any more about this. All right. So we've done the arrival bonus stuff. The last thing for the rival bonus is everybody gets a plus one strength token because Timothy has red fist. So let me get those out. And because of red fist, not only is it a plus one strength token means you get it for us to showdown, but then also if you have any plus one strength tokens, you can use it in place of Spain survival. So technically Adam can have two, it's like he has two survival. All right, so now I'll show you the showdown for the Phoenix. So this is the picture for the Phoenix. It's pretty cool. And as you can see in the mouth, there's actually like an old man's face. We see his uh, whiskers sort of draping off the mouth. The person getting impaled by the talons. And you see a bunch of tiny hands on the wings as well. And then, a lot of stuff. It says here, the phoenix fills the horizon of your mind. Complex and disturbing, your very essence seems to flicker like a dying lantern. A perfect mixture of excitement and dread shakes up your insides. Before you realize it, you find yourself stepping forward to battle. You know, we had a fire... And then we found someone with a, a key. And then we went into overwhelming darkness. And all of a sudden in this darkness, we get attacked by the phoenix. So it's pretty scary. Um, so for the showdown, we're going to have two acanthus plants, two stone faces, which we haven't seen yet, and a nightmare tree, which as you recall, we saw in the very beginning of the campaign, which had good and bad stuff happen. Because we are in a nightmare. So now we're seeing giant faces, a nightmare tree with a nightmare. Being resourceful, we found a couple stray plants. All right, so now let's do the setup. I was hoping to get some of those sweet, sweet Phoenix resources during the hunt. But it looks like all we got was, well, no, we got a key, which we don't know what the key does. So we did get a key. That is true, which could be super valuable. It sounds like it's valuable. So. And we're not in a terrible position. If anyone would have zero survival, the best person to do it would be a person with Frenzy Drink. Because if you do Frenzy Drink, you can't spend survival anyway. So I could just have him start in the very beginning with that bonus. Might as well. Because he only has one survival. So like, I could like dash, spend action to do Frenzy Drink, and then just go at it or something like that. Might as well start off strong. All right, so for the setup, um, I'll save showing you the cards of the Phoenix. Um, 
Well, but that may influence how I sit up. So we probably will show those cards, actually, now that I think about it. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to I'm, I'm not gonna set up the decks because we're not actually doing this showdown. But let's go ahead and set up the uh, terrain. So the nightmare tree is placed in the center. Which is a little hard to do because it's not quite three spaces. Well, I mean it is, but it, 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 it's not quite in the center of the board. Because the center of the board, so I guess let's play off center. So like that. And then everyone has to be placed within six spaces from uh, in a diamond from the nightmare tree, six spaces away. But before that, and now we place everything else. Okay, so let me get out the acanthus, which we have two. The acanthus just has to be six spaces from acanthus, whereas the stone face um, have to set five spaces away from all board edges. Otherwise, wherever I want. So for the Nightmare Tree, it is an obstacle and impassable. So again, I can use it like a giant uh, rock, the block line of sight. The same thing with the Stone Face. But then also with the Stone Face as an action, I can uh, move onto any space occupied by the giant Stone Face. And then range, ranged weapons get plus two range and plus two accuracy. So I can go on top on these stone faces to shoot my bow, which make it better to hit. And then survivors atop the stone face move normally on it and ignore obstacles when drawing line of sight. And monsters may always draw a line of sight to them. And it says it's impassable. And just so you remember, as a reminder, and also for me, Impassable means survivors cannot move through the spaces occupied by this terrain. Um, it doesn't mean that the monster can't. It's just that we can't. I have to climb up the stone face in order to be up on it. And I can use it to block line of sight if I'm behind it. But if I'm on top of it, I'm in line of sight by, the, by getting advantages to my attack. So impassable stuff, the monsters can always go through. So I, I think I may not have been playing that way, but if I recall how I played before, I never had a situation that the monster's movement was blocked by an object. If you think they were always the short pillars, which were destroyed anyway. But I have to remember that. It only affects the survivors. Okay, so stone face just has to be a, a range from the edges. So I can negotiate it so they're around here, potentially. But the only people that get the bonus from the stone face on top of it is people with ranged. But if I'm behind it, I can be out of line of sight. And the phoenix starts in the tree. Like so. And does take up three spaces. Whereas normal monsters only take up two. And even when I had the uh, um, the King's Man and the Butcher, when I made it, I honestly lose, used the wrong base. I should have used a base that takes up two spaces, not one, because as a monster, they actually take up two spaces. 
even though they both look like people and should be able to take up one space like this, they actually take up two. I mean like a grid of two, so four spaces. Anywho. So these have to have to be five spaces away from the edge. One, two, three, four, five. So I could place one here potentially. And I could place one here potentially. If there's any advantage to doing that. I mean I could still get attacked by the monster. It would just the block line of sight I kinda wanna be be able to go in between. So I mean, I could set up like this. I just don't know if there's any reason to do that. Because if I had it like this, then I could be out of line of sight, in line of sight. But honestly, if I'm here and the monster's there, this being here when a block line of sight because we both I have line of sight to it so it, pro it obviously has line of sight to me so maybe that is the best move on the other hand if I attack here and it flies away I could then hide so you know what I'll, I'll mix it up just in case it goes to shit so I have options so I'll have it be like this well, I guess that has to be that close if I do that. Unless... No, it's the same. It doesn't matter. This has to be five away, so this has to go here if I'm going to do that. But this could be like there. Something like that. And then they can't and then the canthus just has to be six spaces from other canthus. So I could do something like this. Actually, it could be something like this. Yeah, I'll do that. So you have the nightmare tree with some acanthus growing around it and stone faces encircling it. And if I'm on stone, if I'm behind stone faces, I can hide from line of sight. And if the monster is not on the tree, I can run around to be out of line of sight. I could like tuck in to hide. Okay, we can roll that. We'll do this so we can reference. And now everyone has to be placed in a six spaces away from the monster. And remember, the monster is gonna go first. So before I determine where to place, let's go ahead and see, well, how's, what's happening with the monster? So for the monster, I'll shuffle decks later because we're not playing. We're not going to do the showdown right now anyway. But it's got Phoenix, and that's got Materialize, Zeal, Spiral Age, and Dreaded Decade. It's a lot of time-related stuff. So, let's get them out. So they, these shall be labeled S. So we had we have Dread a Decade, which can affect people. We have Spiral Age. We have Zeal. And we have Materialize. So Materialize looks like it can teleport around the board. Zeal means after it does a AI, it does a basic action. Spiral age means 
Remove all age tokens. I gained 400 experience for each token. And if you gain more hunt experience than available, you cease to exist. You just start aging and they just disappear. And then during a decade, you roll d10. If the result is equal to or less than your insanity, remove all age tokens. Otherwise, you get spiral age. So it looks like the monster takes, always does a basic action and an AI and can teleport around and people slowly die over time. If you have dreaded decade. So what is it? its basic action is it'll attack you or do disdain. And if it does disdain, you place the phoenix at the center of the nightmare tree. It emits a hissing moan and then everyone gets brain damage and spiral age. So if I if it goes to a tree, it'll start um, moaning and everyone just takes brain damage, which is bad because if you have if you don't have much insanity, then that means you'll age super quick, and then fade away. Okay, so that's it in a nutshell. So basically, it's gonna teleport around and I want it to be able to attack it, and I want it to be able to attack me. But its range is also, movement is 8, so it should be able to always reach us. So, But the fact that it moves so far, definitely want to be able to engage it. Okay, so that's general stuff I know about it. He, uh, he all I know is like, he, it obviously has a lot of movement, probably hits hard, and it's creating this nightmare reality. So, good stuff, right? Okay, so we need to be placed six spaces away from the monster. Meaning wherever it is, he has count six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I just want to have everybody in range and also have the ability to hide if it starts going to shit. But I can't have everybody hide because there's no targets then he'll start uh, screaming at everybody. Eve is the most in danger because it only has one insanity. So with Eve, I definitely want to try to do Lucerne's Lantern to do guaranteed crits. But the problem with Eve also is she also has a shit ton of hunt experience already. So if she gets like seven or eight more hunt experience, she could immediately die in this encounter. So it's like, oh shit, maybe she was a bad choice, right? Also, my idea was, oh, I don't know how the fight's going to go. I could sacrifice her to get some free crits in to, to help sh Make sure I kill the monster in case I don't know how it fights. But because she ages so quickly, she actually has a huge disadvantage in this fight. So, And she has no insanity. So she has a high chance of dying because of this time effect or whatever. So we'll see. So I may... And if that's the case, I'd rather sacrifice her for some guaranteed ability. Is the idea. Because she adds a permanent blue to her grid... So right now she has uh, two blue. Which means I could either add two to my luck, which is already three, or I could do her ability and have two guaranteed crits and ignore traps. So I don't know. Okay. And the monster's going to go first. And the monster's going to do some weird effect and then also attack people. And it hits really hard. And it looks like the monster also soars. The monster's soaring around 
but then also has the ability to teleport. Has the ability to teleport and then rawr, teleport. Rawr. And then if there's no targets, gets so far away, does time. So that's pretty crazy. Um, I think I want to have separations because it's soaring around. I definitely want to be able to hide. So I, I think I want to have people spread out for this, actually. Or maybe I want to be groups of two that are close. Maybe I want to be in groups of two that are close. So let's have... I want to get in crits, so maybe I'll have Oko and Eve together. That way, she can add, he can add to her ability to attack more often, the crit. And then Adam and Timothy will be together, who have a lot of hits. But if they have a lot of hits, that means the, the monster can also move. So that may also be bad. So maybe I should, maybe, maybe I should have it be. Just because if you if you draw a lot of cards, there's a higher chance you can draw a trap card. And then if it if I scare it away, I want to scare it away toward my friends. Um, so maybe I'll do two and two. So I'll do of Eve and Timothy together. something like this and then these two will be something like this and let me also check the orders to make sure no one has anything that impairs them to do something so eve has post max stress it has nothing in the showdown oko if ever gets knocked hit in the head is knocked down automatically no other disorders okay But I do have some people that if they get a plus perfect hit, they either get more insanity or... Well, it's too. It should get insanity for perfect hits. So... And then he'll get more strength for perfect hits. Okay, so I have to be six spaces away, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Or one, two, three, four, five, six. Do something like that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 And here we go. One, two, three, four. Five, six. Or one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. I don't want her to be that far away from people, though. So maybe I'll have them wrap around this side. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Could do something like that, or it could go one, two, three, four, five, six. I want to have a little bit of separation. But then would be in line of sight.
technically out of line of sight, out of line of sight, out of line of sight. In line of sight. Well, I said one, two, three, four, five, six. I have to be really far away. Or maybe I should move this plan up one, do something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Would have that be her. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I would have this current setup. If I'm looking at this current, one, two, three, four, five, six. With this setup, if I'm looking at this correctly, everyone should be out of line of sight. But I'll check the showdown just to check line of sight again, just to make see how they do it. See, do they do it point to point, which I was doing, but it looks like they made this doing by squares from it. So it should be like boom, 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 boom. So that line of sight, squares from it. Boom, 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 so out of line of sight. I would argue they're all out of line of sight. Especially since you have the stone face which blocks line of sight. I could argue that. We're in total darkness. We uh, hear that this flying, shrieking phoenix. We figure, oh shit, it's, it's soaring, it's screaming, let's hide. But it's ambushing. Because obviously it detects us. So. So there's always bad things to happen if you have um, age tokens. And if you have spiral age, when there's age tokens, bad shit happens. Otherwise, spiral age looks like this does damage. So initially, it's come at us. It's not going to detect us. It's, well, but it's also going to do an action. But like, we're in darkness. We hear and feel the vibration of this huge thing flying around. So we're getting down low behind these stone faces. And we hear this thing in this tree. It's going to come at us. So we're sort of getting down low. But it's going to obviously fly at us from this tree before we have a chance to do anything at the monster. It gets too high up. It's loud. It's proud. Cool, so I think we got the initial setup, and we know a little bit about the monster. We have a little bit of a strategy going on. We want to keep people separated in case it charges, but we also have want to have someone close so two people can engage if possible. So I think it's a good idea. Um, the only other problem would be if it gets in a line that it will swoop. Um, I just don't know how it's gonna attack, because this is, this is only impossible to us, so I think this is a good idea, good strategy. Spread out, but have two teams close, to, teams of two close to each other. Cool. All right, so that is what we're going to do. All right, so that's it. going to be it for this stream. Uh, the next stream is going to be the epic battle with his gigantic miniature. So be sure to tune in for that fight. See what happens. See how we do. Like I said, the only person I'm really worried about is Eve because... Her unique ability to gain hunt experience and have low insanity might be what gets her killed. 
and Adam has no survival, practically. And Oko has super insanity, so maybe he's going to be the hero. We'll see. All right, um, we'll tune in next time. Again, this is Ismorda, and thanks for watching.